Yeah, so, well, I'm going to talk today about something that um, I guess I've got into, but I am an atmospheric chemist, so it is, I would say, an atmospheric policy from an atmospheric chemist's point of view, um, and, and you'll see why I've got interested. Um, oh, and I know that turned it on yet. Is that enough? That should work. Yeah. So the atmosphere, we've got a few um, United Nations conventions that, are, that involve the atmosphere, and, and I'll start to take you through them. But this is just a timeline, and this is a timeline that I created, um, because in 1972 was when there was a UN conference and they decided that they would set up the UN Environmental Program. So UNEP was developed, um, created, in 1972. So that's not long ago. So in terms of the UN being engaged and and starting to put in pl policy in place or like policy instruments in place that can be used to control internationally what goes on because the atmosphere, like the oceans, doesn't really have the boundary. It's an international problem. And um, that is, that is different on the land, I believe. So they have, they have good strategies on land, um, mostly. So that was developed in 1972. The Vienna Convention for the Protection of the Ozone Layer was actually signed up by everyone in 1985. That was, it was only in, in 1985 that the ozone hole over Antarctica was discovered. So actually, the policy, the instrumental, the international policy instrument was put in place around the same time that they realized they had a really big problem. And so there was a lot going on before that. And I'll, I'll take you through the, the story of ozone because I think that's, that's a very nice example. The Montreal Protocol, so the, the Vienna Convention, is you don't hear too much about it because it was a framework convention, it was just putting in place how, how are we going to start negotiating, how, how the international community will come together. And so that's, this sort of leads into our exercise this afternoon because the, and why we needed to establish a base here so that we needed to have the framework in place so we can actually start negotiating. And that's what the, the Montreal Protocol, that there um, is, was an instrument that came in place, it was binding, countries came in, and they had different targets by different times, that sort of thing. So that's where, where the policies started com to come in place. But the Vienna Convention was before that and was really what brought everyone to the table. And then, so IPCC was developed in 1988 also very recent, and then, then the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change. So these are the UNFCCC, and you hear about the Conference of the Parties, and that's what we're going to be negotiating this afternoon, and we've got Paris coming up at the end of the year, so the 21st convention there. And so that is a framework convention, and under those conventions, then you start getting protocols. And so the Kyoto Protocol has expired, and, um, and then the, we're talking now about post-2020 emissions for carbon. Uh, and, and then there are a few other instruments which involve the, the atmosphere in particular. So persistent um, organic pollutants. So that's really DDT. Other, other pollutants that we've used widely in the environment, and now we're like, ah, what have we done? Um, and, and so there's the minima... Minimatar Convention on Mercury uh, is the, the most recent. Um, so this is also a convention. Uh, it was signed in 2013. Um, you need to get 50 of the parties to come on board for it to be ratified. And then so that will come into, it will say that the convention has been enacted um, once we've got 50 parties on board. And that hasn't happened yet. It's only 12. I'm going to introduce you to a, um, a, a very good scientist, a very good chemist, um, very famous, 
um, or, or less famous, infamous really. Um, so Thomas Smidley. He had over a hundred patents. He was extremely esteemed. Um, the fellow of the US National Academy of Sciences. He was the developer of tetraethyl lead. So that's the additive um, to petrol. Uh, and also he developed Freon. Uh, so that's your CFCs, and I begin to talk a lot about them later. Um, very nice quote about Midley. He had more impact on the atmosphere than any other single organism in the history of Earth. 1.1 million deaths has been estimated from the use of putting lead in petrol. Um, and, and then there's a lot of skin cancer. It's hard because of the lag for cancers um, to know the full impact, but we've got estimates. There's about 10,000 deaths um, per year for skin cancers, but in terms of like what excess cases over the lifetime of the ozone hole and, and what we've done to the stratosphere, there's um, estimates around 70,000 um, per year. Um, I can say a little bit more about, about him actually. Um, he gave himself lead poisoning a few times um, and still advocated for the use of lead in petrol. And that didn't kill him. Um, and of course, the, the CFCs were much, um, they were, came into wide use well after he was, he had invented them. But he got polio and he, um, and he had to create this system of pulleys to help him in his bed. And he ended up strangling himself at the age of 55 through, through that. So it was one of his inventions that killed him, just not quite what you'd expect. I'm, I've talked about the atmosphere and I'm not sure how many people um, even think about it. So I'd like a show of hands of people who do atmospheric modeling or atmospherists. So we're, we're definitely in the minority. <laughs> so this slide is for, for everyone else. This is the atmosphere and the atmosphere is largely defined or its different properties are largely defined by its temperature structure. And so we have the troposphere below. The tropo is, is turning. So, so we have a decrease in temperature up to around 10 kilometers. And that's where your planes fly up here, top of Everest, tropopause level here. And so we've got a temperature decrease in there. And that means that if you heat some, a parcel of air, it will rise up and you get these convective systems. You get clouds, you've got lots of water. Um, so all, all the weather, everything happens here. Above that, we've got the stratosphere. And I'll be talking a little bit about that because that's where the, the ozone is. And, and the ozone is the reason that we're getting an increase in temperature through that region. So ozone, tiny three, molecule, three atom molecule, um, absorbs UV radiation when it comes in and converts that to heat. And that's the converting to heat, warms that layer, and so we're getting an increase in temperature. What that means is you've got a warm air parcel, it's not going to rise, it's not going to move anywhere, and actually all the transport's horizontal. So it's stratified, and so that's where stratosphere comes from. Transport in the horizontal largely. And then above that we've got um, so 20% of the, the atmospheric mass in the, the stratosphere, 80% in the troposphere, and above that, there's not a lot going on, except we've got some interesting, we've got some interesting winds, wave breaking, dynamical effects up there, and aurora, which I will show you here. So that top part of the atmosphere, um, I heard some people wanted to say, see some aurora down here, and um, so I want to talk a little bit briefly about aurora because it's beautiful. Um, so you get different colors. It's, the, it's oxygen, which will give you yellow and green above 100 kilometers, and you get reds above two, 200 kilometers, and um, ionic nitrogen. So once it's, you're creating ions you're, or you're exciting these particles, and I'll talk a lot about that tomorrow when I talk about greenhouse gases, about these electronic transitions. And then you've got neutral nitrogen, um, 
which is the crimson do you see that they have so that is all I talk about in terms of that this is what um, this is what the atmosphere looks like if you create a log scale here and blow up the stratosphere so to make the stratosphere extremely important which it is um, then I mean, it's very interesting the chemistry in the stratosphere is so much simpler um, to understand than, than down in the troposphere. Essentially what happens is we've got the major convector systems in the tropics and we're getting air transported into the stratosphere there. And we've got these major, the major arms of the Brewer-Dobson circulation. So Brewer and Dobson um, discovered ozone, uh, ways of measuring it and worked out the, these transport processes, it's called the overturning circulation of the atmosphere. Um, and so you get this major arm coming and descent of air in the polar regions, uh, particularly at the winter pole. And, um, and so the summer pole's got the, the weaker arm of the broad opposite circulation. And then you've got a little bit of um, transport across here, not a lot mixing. And most of this transport is in the horizontal directions. So we get the, the air coming in and then being transported horizontally towards the poles and descending. The age of air at the poles is around six years old. So we'll get air in the troposphere will mix across the hemispheres on the time scale of about one year. And so a chemical constituent needs to stay in the atmosphere longer than one year-ish unless it's being produced here in the tropics, in which case time scales of like this convection can happen in an afternoon so you can have things that have very very short lifetimes getting transported up but on the whole if you've got something long lived it'll be well mixed throughout the whole troposphere and it'll get into the stratosphere and so that's most of your greenhouse gases are stable long lived will make it everywhere in the atmosphere and um, CFCs are one of those now, Alex mentioned nitrogen uh, being 80% of our, um, the air that we're breathing. Then we've got oxygen, argon. And so those three constituents make up almost 100% of the atmosphere and everything else is trace. Carbon dioxide, so all the greenhouse gases, everything that you see there is really trace. Um, and we've got and some of our really strong greenhouse gases, very, very small. What you'll notice about water is huge ranges, so highly variable. And um, so water has a lifetime in the atmosphere of about 10 days, and, but it's largely controlled. The amount of water that the atmosphere can hold is controlled by temperature. Um, so I am getting onto policy very soon. <laughs> but I needed to introduce the atmosphere. I was getting a bit excited. So I'm talking about, going to talk about the Montreal Protocol, and I'm going to talk about the Minamata uh, Convention. I'm going to talk about game theory and decision making. So and that's hence the cards. Um, and and then we're having our negotiation session this afternoon. Uh, I'll talk about greenhouse gases tomorrow, and I'll talk about aerosols and clouds on Friday. A little bit and like many of these lectures I think I could talk about these things all for one week so I will try and hold myself back so the Montreal Protocol first of all and uh, so it had obtained universal ratification in 2009 so quite a long time afterwards the last country who had been holding out for a wee while eventually signed on but it was the very first um, international environmental agreement to achieve this. So 197 countries signed up. It's widely considered the most successful environmental policy to date. And I'll go through why. Um, and until there is a climate policy or protocol in place that really does bring down the, the emissions and things, that, will, that may remain the case. Part of its success was due to a timetabling of the phase out and um, so binding agreement, mandatory phase out of, of chemicals. 
that were leading to the ozone depletion. Uh, there were trade sanctions um, put in place. Um, so people would not trade with countries that produced these chemicals. And there's a regular review process. So uh, scientific review, but also a review of the policy. Is it achieving what we need it to achieve? Is there other um, mechanisms that we can use to do that? And it was the first, um, in the first international treaty to create a multilateral fund to assist um, in the phase out, bringing in new technologies, etc. And that fund has been, like to date, has given out $2.5 billion US. So all those, all those things have led to, it, to its success. You won't be able to read this, and it's just a timeline showing um, when sort of the pro process and why was it successful. I do want to highlight a couple of things. So here in 1963, they, um, Dobson published a paper indicating strange behavior in ozone um, in the Antarctic region. Um, in 1973, so they started to, there was the identification in the 1970s that we had the Molina and Sherwood um, published that CFCs um, could start reacting in the atmosphere if they break down. Uh, McCarthy from DuPont declares, if credible scientific data show that any CFCs cannot be used without a threat to health, DuPont will stop production of these compounds. That was in 1973 they said that. That's an extremely useful statement when, when it comes to bringing in policy later on. And around 1985, um, they discovered the ozone, the Antarctic ozone hole. I'll show you what that is, um, but it was discovered at that point. DuPont was, had the patents for CFCs. They, the patents were running out in 1985 by saying, by put, introducing policy that would um, ban those, those CFCs, put them in a very powerful position because they would have had to open, the patents were open, everyone in the world could start producing them. Of course you'd like to ban them if you've got the substitute compound ready to go. Everyone's become reliant on refrigerants, etc. So that was you know, industry got behind it really quickly, um, so that was also a very interesting um, story behind what went on there. So ozone. Ozone and why do we care and why do people care? So ozone is extremely important for the structure of the atmosphere uh, and it's the, particularly the stratospheric ozone up here. If we brought all that ozone down to the surface, it would be three millimetres thick. So there's really not much of it in the atmosphere, but it's very, very important for shielding life on Earth from the harmful UV rays because if the UV rays come through, it'll damage your DNA. Uh, ozone down low, it, it can increase from pollution and is actually responsible in some city areas for like decreasing crops and human health. So crop production can be decreased by about 50% due to large surface pollution of ozone. So very different processes. Well, actually the same chemistry going on. It's just very different roles because we don't, ozone is very useful when it's far away and protecting us as a shield. It's not great to be breathing it. Um, Everyone will probably know what ozone smells like. It's sort of the smell around a photocopy machine. So that we've been exposed to it. <laughs> um, so ozone, this is got maps of ozone and, and this is the stratospheric picture. Interesting, like I said, most air comes in at the tropics and that's where the amount of UV is. You need UV to produce ozone and ozone is destroyed. It's relatively short-lived and quite reactive. 
which is why it's bad for you because of reactive. So most of the ozone is created actually in the tropics, and it's that transport processes. So transport in the stratosphere is extremely important for the distribution of ozone. And so what happens is the, if we start here, um, so this is our summer, in December, January, February, and, and you know winter up here in the northern hemisphere. Now, we've got that the major arm of the Broadobson circulation transporting effectively the ozone. And so you actually get a maximum in spring in the polar region. And that's nicely seen in the in the northern hemisphere. You get mixing out of it um, into summer. Um, and and you should then down here in early spring, so in the winter pole here, you're getting a nice even distribution. You get here like an increase, and it's actually called an ozone, some people call it an ozone mountain. You would expect there to be a large amount of ozone here over Antarctica. But we've got very interesting chemistry going on, and I'll get into what, what that chemistry is happening there, and we're getting a large ozone hole where there should be a ozone maximum. And then when that ozone hole breaks up, it depletes, it causes a depletion over the entire hemisphere. Now what's going on, and I, I show this, this plot showing where the chemistry, what's doing the chemistry for the ozone destruction. Now ozone's very reactive and all of the chemistry practically in the, in the stratosphere is radical chemistry. And that you can't say that in many, many places um, because radicals don't generally exist for very long. But when you've got very, the densities are quite low and you can start to sustain radical chemistry. Sorry, what a radical is, so radical is you've, um, it's got a lone electron, and that makes it, ex and I will get into what electron structure, etc. tomorrow. For people who haven't done chemistry, I'm, I'm sorry to show such a plot, actually. <laughs> but it means that we've got a lone electron on that nitrogen oxide, and that means it's highly reactive and it wants to grab another electron from something and it will choose anything. And so... So we've got all of these as radical cycles. So this here you can look at as OH or, or um, H2O. No, OH2. <laughs> um, wrong way around. I don't want water. It's the other one. Um, HO2. We've got um, this here is ozone or singlet oxygen by itself. And here we've got the nitrous oxides, so NO or NO2. And those are, you hear those, they're emitted from um, vehicles, etc. as well. And this ties into nicely what fertilizers do. So fertilizers, N2O is produced in the, um, in the atmosphere eventually produced by agriculture, gets into the atmosphere, it's a very strong greenhouse gas, and has a big role in the ozone cycles up here. So this was ozone, um, the ozone they saw over Antarctica. And right through the 1980s, in October, it was relatively normal, relatively high, then it dropped suddenly. And, and has stabilized down there at the moment. So this is the ozone hole happening in the spring. And this is the ozone profile. Usually early winter, and as soon as we get special conditions, almost complete depletion, and that's not the case in the Arctic where you're actually getting a maximum there of an increase in ozone. These are the chemicals that are causing it. And all I want you to take away from this is that the anthropogenic sources here, uh, there's the bromine and there's the chlorine. So there are some natural sources of these compounds to the stratosphere, here and here. 
and these are from algae, uh, largely. Um, these are all of those CSCs, refrigerants, halons, um, so foams, aerosols, etc. Coming in there. So what is the ozone hole? And why does it form? Now we've got a very strong vortex over the polar region. The Antarctic, you've got, it's very cold, much colder than the Northern Hemisphere because the heat transport in the Southern Hemisphere over the atmosphere is much weaker than it is in the Northern Hemisphere because you've got much more land, much more waves in that area pushing the air towards, you're getting much less dynamical stability in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, you've got a very stable, you've created a reaction vessel that's cut off. You've got these winds that are going extremely fast, um, cutting it off. It's very cold and you get these beautiful polar stratospheric clouds forming. And on the surface of those clouds, you're getting like the nitrogen being locked into the clouds and the, and the, the OH also being locked into the clouds and the chlorine being released. And so the chlorine is unable to be um, quenched and it's in a radical, very reactive form. And so when the sun comes back out, suddenly the ozone loss cycles due to chlorine go unchecked. And that's, that's what happens until you get the dynamical breakdown of the, of the vortex. So that's why you get all the ozone in the in that region being depleted. And so normally they thought they were going to have, um, they thought CFCs would only be a problem at around 40 kilometers. And it turned out that because of this heterogeneous chemistry, so reactions on a surface that was much, um, suddenly you've got these interesting <laughs> And I'm going to show you a nice video of So this is a model simulation of ozone in the stratosphere. And um, some of you may know Kane, Kane Stone. So he's doing a PhD. Um, he ran these model simulations and then did the visualization of this, but he also wrote the music for this video. And um, because it didn't sound good enough, I'm playing it on a piano. So we've got the polar stratospheric clouds coming in now, um, and soon the ozone will start depleting. I guess he plays the plays the music on his computer. See the nice break up, the swirling there, like it's a bit like a coffee cup, mixing and, and essentially depleting the ozone over the entire southern hemisphere when it does this. So why do we need to do something about the, the fact that there was the ozone hole? So we, there was the identification that CFCs were going to be bad for the stratosphere. It was going to deplete ozone. We were perhaps going to get a little bit more. Um, so it affects the dynamical structure of the entire atmosphere. If you deplete all the ozone, suddenly you don't have a cap on the, on the, on the troposphere. So people got quite scared about that. Now... <coughs> Something we hear a little bit here in Australia, and I do want everyone to walk away from, is that the ozone hole does not exist over Hobart or 
over anywhere in Australia actually it exists and forms once a year over Antarctica. And while you get the influence of that, the major, um, the major drivers be behind skin cancers is latitude and, and skin colour, so behavioural. Uh, and we know that Australia in particular, you've got a lot of people who have come from latitudes that are much further north than we, much further, um, um, yeah, the further north than we are south. So effectively, you're getting, so say 55 is around London, um, Europe, you've got the top of Africa starts to become similar to what other UV exposures you expect in Australia. And there's a couple more effects. The, the southern hemispheric summer, we are closer to the sun than in the, the northern hemispheric summer, just from the orbital path. And then there is also, there's a whole lot of aerosols in the southern hemisphere. And so that accounts for 50% more UV in the middle of summer at the same latitude. In the, in the southern hemisphere compared to the northern hemisphere. So all of these attributes do lead to Australia having the um, extremely high skin cancer rates. But this is what would have happened um, and, and will happen actually due to the ozone hole and we can expect to have very high skin cancer rates um, in, in the southern hemisphere due to the ozone hole. And there's a lag time in all cancers. So our generation will be form part of these numbers. So that's why we really needed to do something. So we've got latitude as the major driver. Then the, there's some distance from the ozone hole. The ozone hole has decreased um, the ozone overhead by about 5%. So it's a 5% contributor. There's cloud cover and forest altitudes. You're going to get burned if you go skiing in winter. Um, all these things come in to it. So how successful was the Montreal Protocol? Now what we can see from this plot is that if we had no protocol, this is what, how much chlorine we'd have had in the atmosphere. And the Montreal Protocol decreased that by a little bit. But it was really the amendments afterwards that, and Beijing in particular, really brought down the amount of chlorine that we could expect to have in the, the atmosphere. So, the Montreal Protocol really just got everyone on board because we'd have still been in big trouble in terms of case, um, there's the extra excess cases of skin cancer. Still would have had an awful lot. And so, you know, Copenhagen's there. So we're still going to have some up till um, 2060, but we're, it's been limited. <clears throat> so we've got the main gases, and I haven't talked too much about them, but CFCs are the refrigerant. Halons are essentially all the fire extinguishers, and then there are um, the HCFCs are the replacement gases. Now there are strategies in place. You will get a two hundred thousand dollar fine if you decide to open up your refrigerator and release all the gases. So I advise not to do that. Um, but there, it does go into banks, and and there are some in some countries no no way of not. Um, no way of capturing and destroying those. And so it's a large amount in the bank. What happens in, in terms of like the recovery of ozone and, and the links to climate, you saw from that plot how important nitrogen is for destroying ozone. So nitrogen is part of the story here, but also, and I'll explain tomorrow why, while the surface is heating, so the surface of the planet was heating due to greenhouse gases, so carbon dioxide, methane will increase the temperature at the surface, the stratosphere cools. That slows down all the ozone reactions and actually produces a large increase in ozone. So this is ozone, right? So we've got observations that's decreased everywhere and this is where we're sitting now. With climate change, and this is the business, business as usual scenario, we're going to get a super recovery of the ozone. And, the, and so 
greenhouse gases are a good thing for the ozone layer. Um, it brings forward the recovery date and everything like that. Um, so that's unexpected in a way. And these are, this is breaking it down into the different species. So nitrous oxide, while it does cool it there, what dominates is the chemistry that it causes. So in the stratosphere, so you can see this re it's really quite complicated. We've got nitrogen causing ozone depletion, whereas CO2 and, and methane, methane actually causes OH radical, but it's the cooling effect of those two causing the increase in ozone, and that's what we can expect. So as, as we go towards a changed climate, we are actually going to increase the amount of ozone in the stratosphere. So that's really just pointing out there. And what we see that into the future, the major driver for what goes on in terms of the ozone layer is going to be nitrous oxide here. It's a really strong greenhouse gas, but it's its role in destroying ozone, which will have the major role into the future. So under the Montreal Protocol, um, where all ozone depleting substances can be controlled, it has, was a large discussion about whether or not they would try and control nitrous dioxide, nitrous oxide, because it's a policy instrument already in place and, and had a mechanism there. Of course, that it is not, and it does come under the, under the Kyoto Protocol, and it's also uh, exempt, it's called an exempted use there. So that's a really, it becomes, Pretty interesting. All of the um, all of the CFCs are extremely strong greenhouse gases, and uh, so this is I'll just put that. The Montreal Protocol has done more for climate protection than any mitigation strategy thus far. So we've got how much climate protection, due to just banning all of these CFCs, has been achieved. So that's another reason why it's been, been really successful. It also, like, uh, in this last assessment for the, for the ozone um, assessment, so every, every four years is a scientific assessment which leads into policy deci decisions. Um, ozone is by far the dominant driver of trends in the SAM, so the Southern Annular Mode, that determines how wet, what the weather etc. will be in, in Australia. So in the summer, over the last you know, three to five decades, that's been the dominant trend over greenhouse gases. So greenhouse gases are shown here in the red there. So it's about equal in, equal in autumn. Uh, greenhouse gases are leading uh, the, the major changes in the sand in those Areas. So I know that sand is extremely important for the ocean groups here. So most people know what sand is, driving the wind. The, west, the strength of the westerly winds and the position of the jets over the southern ocean. So now I'm going to get on to the Minamatar Treaty, and I'll show you why you have penguins. And I have to hurry, I guess. Um, so the mercury emissions, uh, largely from the some coal burning, but it's largely from the extraction of gold. In, um, you mercury will grab onto gold, and if you burn it off, um, you will get your gold. Um, and so if you burn it off, you emit mercury directly to the atmosphere where it's in its elemental state and will be able to undergo um, transport. And so Human activities have doubled the atmospheric burden of mercury, and that leads to about a five times um, increase in the cycling of mercury through the biosphere. So all these things are, are bad. Now, mercury is a, um, a neurotoxin. Uh, once it's methylated, it will cross the blood-brain barrier, and so you've heard Matt of, Matt of the Hatter used to use it in the felting processes, and people go crazy. But like lead, another interesting fact about lead is that they estimate, due to the use of leaded petrol, 
there were there are 60 million extra crime cases because it makes people really violent. Mercury just thinks it makes people crazy. <laughs> um, now here's why this is really my interest in Mercury. Um, over the first year sea ice, you get this very interesting, again, a radical species. Um, so it's very reactive, very strong oxidant. Usually mercury in the atmosphere isn't oxidized very readily, not oxidized by its just usual <coughs> boundary layer. But when you get these <coughs> release of essentially sea salt into a radical form, it oxidizes everything like crazy and, and you get depletion of mercury onto the, onto the first year sea ice. This only happens when the sunlight comes back, so it's a bit like what goes on in the ozone hole. And you get a nice pulse of mercury to the biosphere, just as everything's kicking off in spring. So, um, which is some of the reason that albatrosses and petrels of the Southern Ocean have the highest levels of methyl mercury of any seabird ever recorded. <coughs> and this is just an ocean picture of the pulse of mercury. So I guess that's why, why I care about mercury. And and so now there is a treaty in place, and, and so you can see mercury, of course, is the largest controls and use and everything is coming from the gold sector, and it's protecting especially the use of children. I, there are many photos of children standing in pools of mercury extracting gold because it's economic value. So um, that's where the minimum charge convention will have its largest impact. So now we come on to decision making and game theory and um, hopefully sets us up nicely for this afternoon. Um, so consensus versus compromise. I think it's a, a nice um, distinction. Does everyone know the difference there? I've seen a few shakes of the head. Compromise is when both people or both parties or however, you know, everyone gives up a little bit and everyone feels like some people, and they give up something that they, they want in order to be able to meet in the middle. Now that means that both people perhaps feel that they've lost something or, or won something. And so it's, it's never fair. It's a, whereas consensus decision making is seen as we have a problem and we want to move forward uh, with a solution and everyone in the room has to be happy with this decision and and so you have a position where you're not prepared to move from and you can't go forward until everyone's on board so that's it's subtle the difference um, but it's about everyone being on board so in consensus decision making, you are going to have um, everyone agree to it and everyone follow, it, follow up on it. And so that's what we're hoping to achieve this afternoon and that's what the climate negotiations uh, in general want to achieve. They want to have everyone on board moving forward for a, a um, climate um, protection. Now, most decisions um, are made, and most people may or may not appreciate it. It's generally an emotional response, and then you spend a lot of time justifying why you've made that emotional response. And so you'll notice that in, in reaction to climate change, uh, the climate change debate, people are like, I don't believe in it, or it's, um, and they've just made a decision um, and perhaps it's not especially rational, but they'll spend a lot of time justifying it. Um, and, and then there are large, there's ways of stalling. So you're seeking information endlessly or deferring to other people's recommendations all the time. So not, not getting the information, not making the decisions yourself. So now's, now's time for the card game. Um, I just thought of those ones. So everyone needs to take a red and black card, just and pass them round. So. 
this is the biggest um, group of people I've ever tried to do this exercise with. So mm -hmm. I need to do two packs of cards. So, <laughs> but do everyone take a red and black card. <laughs> okay, cool. It's probably not an even amount, but I'll keep sorting. So, so your red card is your, and it's your, well, these are your omissions for your country. You all are a country. You all have a voice. Um, And so you have, you need to decide whether you're going to give me the red card or you're going to keep the red card. So the red card is you giving up your omission and um, the red and, and the black card, if you give me that, just means you've kept your omission. You're going to continue to omit and, and you're going to reap the the benefit of everyone else giving up their emissions and you will still have the economic benefit of keeping your emissions yourself. So, is everyone... You <laughs> might have to share, I wonder if I've got enough. Okay. <laughs> so you can see with this amount of people, you're like, you could actually do nothing and still get the benefit of, of everyone else giving up their emission. Um, or you can have a conscience and, and want to do something good for the world and and give me your, give up your emission for the benefit of everyone. But that means you'll, you'll get slightly less points at the end, um, but everyone, everyone wins. Because if everyone keeps their emissions, right, there'll be no points for anyone. So you need to quickly decide um, whether, whether you'd like to give me your emissions or, or not. Now, the reason you've got two cards is no one will know, right? So you can just everyone file up or um, and give me give me one card, everyone who's got a card. Hmm? You can pass them forward, just bring them down so I can Yeah, I am very interested. Has everyone given me a card? So the red card... So, so again, the red card is your emissions, essentially. So you either give me your emissions, which means you give it up, or you keep your emissions so you can have the economic benefit of still having your emissions, but your emissions... Are, in general, are bad for everyone. So, and the black card's just so I don't know which card you've given me. <laughs> so, has everyone given me? Oh. No, you, you're an individual. <laughs> this is an individual uh, exercise. So while you are, like, there are more countries than this. So. 
<clears throat> Sorry, I don't, yes, I'll. Yeah, sure. I'll just, I'll just sort them first. Yeah. Yeah. So I have 41 countries 